All right, Joshua chapter 4. So if you remember from last week, of course, the entire chapter last week involved the crossing of the Jordan River, and it really went into detail about how the waters stood up, the waters from above were cut off, and the, and the, the land dried up, and they were able to cross clean over on dry land. Now we're in chapter 4, and it, and it retells a little bit of this, but um, there's really not a lot, again, like, like last week, in this chapter, there's not a lot of different events going on in the story or in the timeline. There's really only one main thing. It's the, the continuation of the crossing into Jordan. And then basically they're setting up these stones and then they're camping in Gilgal, which is right next to Jericho, which is we're going to get into then them circling Jericho and the walls coming down and everything else and starting into their battle. So, um, Again, this chapter, is, there's, there's not a lot going on, but there's still a lot to learn from this passage. So let's jump right in here with verse number one. The Bible says, And it came to pass when all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe a man. Now we saw this reference last week in Joshua chapter 3. Uh, verse number, There's only one verse dedicated to this, and the rest of the chapter didn't really deal with it. In verse number 12 of chapter 3, it says, Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every tribe a man. This is when they were informing the people, Hey, God's going to be among you. He's going to do great miracles. He's going to do great works. He's going to be here, so you need to sanctify yourselves. And in, in the middle of kind of telling the children of Israel all of that is when he also said, hey, we also need to separate 12 men out of the 12 tribes of Israel, kind of heads of their household, people who are going to be important people that are set apart, that are sanctified. They need to be chosen out because God has a special job for them to do. And now we're in chapter four and we see what that job is. And you might say, well, what's the big deal? It's, you know, why do you have to go through this effort and like appointing people or ordaining people, you know, just to choose them? to do this work all they're doing is picking rocks up out of the out of the river because that is what their job was their job was to was to take these great stones out of the out of the middle of jordan and then go bring them into gilgal where they're encamping for the night and to set them up there well first of all when god ordains people for a job you know you may not think it's that big of a deal but it is. If, God's, if God wants someone to be chosen to do something, that alone is important and it's, and it's a big job. And we ought not to look down on any jobs that anyone might have, you know, either within a church or just in any service to the Lord. There's some jobs that might seem a little bit more fancy and get a lot more um, appeal or attention. You know, so for example, pastoring a church. I'm at the, the center of attention. I'm kind of a focal point within the church. However, this church is so much more than Pastor Burzens or any pastor for that matter. The church is the whole congregation. And for anything to really be done, the church needs to come together and everyone needs to be doing work in their place. That's how we're going to get the most done for the Lord. So even the jobs that might seem to be like... You, they're not very fancy, they're not that, that great, or you don't get very much recognition or respect, are oftentimes very necessary in supporting. Now, obviously, this job here is um, it's not necessarily for getting a lot of work done, but there is a very great importance to what they're doing. And the importance to what they're doing is the memorial of this event. This is a huge miracle. I mean, this is, this is a big deal that the, the River Jordan is completely stopped up and they're passing over on dry ground. And when God chooses to do something like this, and when you read through the Bible, don't forget, you know, you may be able to read through this Bible in a short, relatively short period of time, but you're spanning thousands of years when you read this book. I mean, thousands of years of history are, are tied together in, in a very short book. So when you see the miracles that are performed, we could read and go from miracle to miracle to miracle to miracle, right? Because you're reading through Exodus and you, you get to Joshua, you, know, you, get, you get to all these different things. You see this. But over the course of history, it's not really that much of these huge major events of, you know, 
water's drying up and people crossing, you know, there's not a lot of that going on in history. So when God chooses to perform a miracle like this using people, he wants to make sure that this is, this is not going to be forgotten. This is not just going to be brushed aside or easily forgotten. So the people they chose, this is an important job that they're doing. You might say, well, anyone can lift stones. Okay, anyone can lift stones, but they had chose out 12 people that were supposed to be the honorable people to get this job and this service in order to, to build this memorial. And the memorial itself is very important. We're going to get to that in just a minute, though. Let's keep reading here. Or wait, before we keep reading, verse number four, we just read this. It says, Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. So these people had this job, but they still had to be prepared. Uh, um, Joshua made, you know, search on who is going to be picked out. We don't get a lot of details in this, but as we read from the previous chapter, you know, there's going to be twelve men taken out of the tribe of Israel, and that they're, they're choosing these people. They've been prepared. They're ready to do this job. And they already know in advance, hey, God's got a special job for you to do. Now, in order for us to be prepared, and this, this kind of follows on the coattails of last week, we want to make sure that we are ready, that we're prepared, that we get ourselves sanctified, that we guys are getting sin out of our life so that we would be ready and prepared to do any job that God has before us. And again, not to scoff or, or, or think lightly about any job, no matter what it is, whatever it is that you can do, but to do it wholeheartedly and to be ready to serve. Think about what a great work. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples in the Bible, but how many of those disciples do we really know much of anything about? There's only a handful. And we know about Peter and James and John. They get the most recognition or the most um, Bible time out of, out of all the disciples. And we hear about Judas, of course, and we hear about a couple others here or there. But they were all there. They're all doing the work. And the Bible says that, you know, at the, when Jesus comes back to rule and reign, that the 12 apostles are going to be ruling and reigning over the 12 tribes of Israel. So every single one of those apostles was doing a great work, a mighty work, a very important work, a work that, that built up the day of Pentecost. When, when all the plowing and everything is being done, when Jesus is walking on this earth for, you know, for all that work and the, and the ground being, being um, you know, worked out and the word of God being preached. So that way when you get to the day of Pentecost, you have thousands saved. Thousands in one day, in one area, in one location. Thousands of people come into Christ. What a great event. And then all the work that continued on after that and turning the world upside down with doctrine and everything that was done is, is as a result of the work of John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and his, his disciples, his apostles. I mean, that ministry when Jesus was on this earth you know, kind of grew and shrunk. It grew, it had people following him, and then it went right back down to pretty much him and the twelve. Even though we don't know a lot about those other apostles, we know they had to have done a great work, a very, very critical, important work, an important job. So we don't need to worry about the, who's getting the most attention in any service to the Lord, because it's not about that. And those that are getting the attention need to be careful that you're not heaping up glory on yourself because it's all for the service of the Lord anyways. That's why God likes to choose men like Moses who are meek and humble, who aren't trying to just build themselves up and everything they're doing is for the Lord. Because that's the attitude that we all need to have. And maybe you end up in a position where you start getting a lot of focus or, or attention because of the work that you're doing for God. Don't let that get to your head. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about, it's about Jesus Christ. It's about doing His work. Let's continue reading here in Joshua chapter 4. Look at verse number 5. The Bible says, And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. Verse number six, that this may be a sign among you. So this is the purpose of what they're doing. He wants this to be a sign. That when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them 
that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. So God wants them to take out these great stones that are coming literally from the middle of the river Jordan, just as proof, as evidence, and they're setting them up as a memorial so that they could say, hey, why, why are all these stones here? Why is there 12 stones, these big stones, just kind of out of place? Right, they're set up in Gilgal in a place where they wouldn't normally just have like rocks all over the place. They just have these 12 stones set up. So that way when people see it, they can be like, why is this here? And look, this is, this is natural for people to just wonder why are things set up the way they are, right? I mean, even, even today, you look at places like Stonehenge. It's a place that has these rocks set up, right? And, and it's obviously they were put there for a specific reason. So people are fascinated by this. So we go and visit and, and there's all these theories. They say, what, what is the purpose of this? When people see that type of work put into it, especially big stones, like, why, why is all this here? And God does this throughout history. He gives them different things and, and different reasons so that they don't forget about the Lord their God. Because he knows that, that the people's faith, it's going to come and go. And right now, they're real solid on serving the Lord. They just had Moses leading them. They've got Joshua leading them. They're on fire. They're going to go, and they're going to win these battles and have these victories. But God also knows that in not that long to come, in some short years, there's going to be times where they're going to be going after idols and going after false gods, and they're kind of going to forget the Lord their God. And he wants to make sure that there's, it's not just extinguished, that there's still things that exist. There's things that are set up. There's landmarks. There's, there's um, signs that are set up so that people won't just completely forget. And that was the purpose of this. So we could see these stones. They're saying, hey, this, is, this actually happened. This is real. So that way when their children hear about these stories, they're not just stories. They become more real. They say, oh, that's what these stones are all about. These literally came out of the middle of Jordan. Like that, that was, you weren't just you know, telling me a fairy tale. This actually happened. This is reality. And it makes things a lot more real that way as well. And, and it's important to notice too because you know, we need to make sure that our children understand the Bible. We, and it's incumbent upon us. And he's telling them, look, you need to make sure that your children know this. Flip over, if you would, real quick to Deuteronomy chapter number 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, this isn't even in my notes, but Deuteronomy 4 is a great passage. And if I get a reason to turn here, I really like to do so because the Bible is very clear that it's incumbent upon us as believers to, to teach our children and teach them well and to teach them and instruct them in the ways of the Lord and in the laws of the Lord and that we would, we would take it as a very, very, very serious task. And let me see where the verse is. Because I know in the beginning it talks about how the... Um, Okay, here it is. Let's, let's start reading in verse number 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, the Bible reads, Keep therefore and do them, talk about this, his commandments and his statutes, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law, which I set before you this day? Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen 
teaching, unless they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons, especially the day that thou sittest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days, that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. So the Bible is telling us, look, I don't want you to forget about this and you need to take diligent heed to make sure that your children don't forget about this and, and, and that they understand the Lord. They understand the, the God that brought his children out of Egypt with a strong hand, with a stretched out arm and, and the, the acts that were done there and all the miracles that were performed and all the plagues that were done by the living God, by the true God, not by these idols of, of stone and wood that are just these images that are carved that people give all this attention to and they bow down and pray and worship, but there's a real living God that does real things, that's, that, that has all power and is almighty, the almighty Lord. And that these things are real. God actually did these things. God actually saved the children of Israel out of Egypt. He performed these plagues. He parted the Red Sea. He parted the Jordan River. And that the people passed over on dry, dry ground. And it's our job to teach the children and make sure that they understand that this is real. This isn't just a fairy tale. And, and we have to diligently take heed to make sure they understand these things and know these things. Otherwise, they're going to be forgotten. And, uh, and what a shame that would be. Let's keep reading. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 4. So the stones are set up to be a memorial. Verse number 8, the Bible says, And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan, as the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. Now, I don't know about you, but I always try to think in my, you know, I get a picture in my mind when I read the Bible trying to see what's, what's going on. And I always try to be careful as well that I'm not thinking about things that aren't actually there. Because whatever it is that you're thinking of, that's going to impact your memory. And oftentimes, people, you might have experienced this also, people argue about the Bible without actually opening up the Bible. And, and this is just kind of a side note. If you're ever discussing doctrine or discussing Bible with people, always turn to the passage don't just take someone else's word for it. And, and even don't even necessarily take your own memory unless you know what the Scripture actually says. I don't know how many times I've had this. And I, I kind of learned just through experience having more and more conversations with people that you don't just accept, oh, the Bible says this or the Bible says that. Even if it sounds really familiar, because oftentimes there'll be one point that they're just completely wrong about that's critical for what they're trying to express or what they're teaching or what they believe. And this isn't even necessarily, be, you know, I've had conversations with people who are great people, great guys, people who are saved and born again, and they, you know, they're not like trying to teach anything false. But when you're just simply going back and forth based on memory of what you think the Bible says, and you don't actually turn it yourself, you're going you're gonna to get yourself into trouble. And then you can start being convinced about things that are wrong or not even true because no one just decided to turn. Say, you know what? Let's just see what the Bible actually does say and go to that. And, and that's, a, you know, again, that's kind of a side note. But, but I strongly recommend you doing it, especially, you know, those of you that really like talking about the Bible with different people and bringing up different doctrines. Make sure you turn to these passages and, and see exactly what they say before you start uh, getting too deep into the Bible doctrine. But when I, when I read this, I was thinking, like, oh, I wonder what they did. Because it sounds like, like or what I've always kind of thought in my mind, was that they kind of set up some type of monument. But it doesn't really say that. There's not a lot of information that we get. It just says they laid them down there. So it's most likely that they probably just laid them down in, in some type of formation. And we don't really know. And it doesn't really matter that much. But it's just kind of one of those things that you, you, know, you just think about. How did they actually do this? But obviously it was in some manner where it was going to be obvious to the children, hey, what are these stones doing here? They didn't belong here. But look at this in verse number 9 because Joshua actually does something else that God didn't tell him to do. And again, this isn't a sin. There's nothing wrong with what Joshua did. God, but God tells Joshua, hey, take 12 men, one man for every tribe, get 12 stones out of the middle of Jordan and place them in the place where you're going to set up your tent tonight, where you're going to lodge overnight. That's where I want that landmark to be. But then Joshua decides also on his own, and I think this is pretty cool because 
it, 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 it's probably not as permanent. I bet this didn't last as long as what God told him to do. But look at what he does in verse number nine. In verse number nine, it says, "And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the ark of the covenant stood, and they are there unto this day." So it looks like Joshua set up this tower of stones just right in the middle of Jordan River, where he's just like, "This is where they stood on dry ground, just kind of right in the middle, and had these stones piled up so you can see, like, like that's exactly where we were." when God just stopped the waters. Because that, cause that's a pretty cool thing, too, just to look out in the river and just be like, yep, that was all dry ground right there, and that marks the spot right there. But obviously, uh, some type of monument or stones being set up in the middle of a river naturally is going to end up being, being toppled or moved or whatever over time. Now, at the time that this was written, you saying it was there till this day. Now, I, I doubt it's still there right now. I'm sure the stones are somewhere in the Jordan River, but I don't think they have that monument set up as it would be from back then after this long. But um, anyways, I, I, thought, I thought that was pretty cool. So when you're reading this too, it's easy to get the two confused. But Josh, this is actually a separate event. This is separate from what the children of Israel did with the, the man of each tribe laying them out in, um, in Gilgal. So let's, uh, let's keep reading here. Verse number 10. The Bible says, For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished, that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over. And it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over that the ark of the Lord passed over and the priests in the presence of the people. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the children of Israel, as Moses spake unto them, about 40,000 prepared for war passed over before the Lord on the battle to the plains of Jericho. And again, we just see the evidence here that they actually did listen to, to Moses. They listened to God that instead of just staying back and remaining behind in the land that, that was their inheritance, they actually followed through and they went over to help their brethren in their battles. Uh, continuing on here, look at verse number 14. Verse number 14 says, On that day the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. Now, we're going to read through kind of the rest of this chapter. There's a few other things that I want to I cover, but um, I'm going to focus for the, the majority of the rest of the time on that phrase that they feared Joshua. And... Um, but let, let's get through this because I'm going to focus on that right at the end. Verse number 15, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Command the priests that bear the ark of the testimony that they come up out of Jordan. Joshua therefore commanded the priests, saying, Come ye up out of Jordan. And it came to pass when the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord were come up out of the midst of Jordan, and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up unto the dry land, that the waters of Jordan returned unto their place and flowed over all his banks as they did before. So once they get all the stones out of there, that's all set up, everything's ready to go, everybody's passed over, then find a lat they were the first ones in were the, the priests that were burying the, the Ark of the Covenant, and they stayed in that in the middle of Jordan while everybody passed through. And now once everybody's made it all the way over safely to the other side, now they're the last ones to kind of get out. And as soon as they're out, as soon as they get to where the dry land would have normally been, then the rest of the waters come down and the, the, the miracle kind of ends at that point and everything returns back to normal. Verse number 19, the Bible says, And the people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. 
again, he's reiterating, your children need to know this. This is important. This memorial needs to be here, and you need to teach it to your children. You need to understand why we're setting up these 12 stones, and you need to make sure that your children know why these are here. What happened? This is what happened in this event. God opened up the, the Jordan River and allowed us to pass through and brought us into this promise. It's a great event. And then it says in verse 20, 24, there, the last verse, it says that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord. See, when God does these mighty events, He wants everyone to know about it. He, knew, he wants His glory to be known in the whole world. Just as it was with, with Egypt and with Pharaoh. God, God set things up. He knew the course of history, of course. And He allowed for Pharaoh to be lifted up to the point that he was at. He, he allowed for the children of Israel to be taken into bondage. And all of that was ultimately... You know, a, a, lot of, a lot of bad things happened and in the end turned out for good for the people of God and turned out to just bring the most honor and glory and respect unto the Lord because he took, you know, he, he's known through impossible situations where it's only God is, can, can have such an impact. Things that, that are just completely unfathomable, human, humanly speaking, it can only be God that does these things. It was the same thing with the children of Israel as, as servants, as slaves, as bondmen in Egypt. They were under control. And then all the plagues that happened, it, it, it's, it's God. And God hardening Pharaoh's heart and not even letting him let the people go just because he wanted to keep making sure that all of this is done so that the whole world knows there's no mistake. The Lord is God in heaven above. And he's the Lord of the whole earth. And there are no other gods but the Lord. He put their, their wise men to shame and everything else, getting that, that uh, recognition. So it says that all people might of the earth might know the hand of the Lord that is mighty. And he says that you might fear the Lord your God Forever. And this is what I'm going to spend the rest of the time this evening focusing on is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a, is a concept I think a lot of people have problems with, not necessarily in this church, but um, just overall. Now, the Bible mentions fear a lot. Fear comes up many, many times in the Bible. One of the things that the Bible teaches about fear is that we don't have to fear anything when God is with us. If God be for us, who could be against us? The Bible says in Genesis 15, 1, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And this is a theme, that's just one verse, but this is a theme that you'll find over and over again through people, you know, men of God or people of God, that he says, look, you trust in me, I'm your defense, I'm your shield, I'm your stronghold, I am your defense, I am there in your time of trouble, you can just trust in me. And when we're trusting in God, we're walking in His ways, we have nothing to fear. The Bible also teaches us that when there is a lack of a fear of God in a nation, that that people is going to be way more prone to wickedness. So one of the reasons why God does these great events is, is to instill fear in the hearts and the minds of people that God is real. And there is a reason to fear. When you see the power of Almighty God... We ought to be shaking and trembling in His presence. And we ought to have that respect and a healthy fear, knowing that God is capable of anything. Even though you might see Him on your day-to-day -day basis, He's not physically going to appear in front of you. We need to remember who God is. We need to remember the attributes of God. We need to remember what makes God angry. And remember the power that Almighty God possesses. And have a healthy respect and fear of the Lord. See, some people will be out there and teach, oh, no, 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 whenever you see fear, that just means respect. No, when you see fear, it actually means fear. It's not, it's not using fear and, and respect synonymously. Now, the two do go hand in hand. But they aren't exactly the same. That's why the Bible will even say, you know, fear and trembling. So you don't just do trembling from, from respect. You tremble out of fear. Um, in Genesis chapter 20, when you remember when you don't have to turn there. Uh, turn if you would to turn if you would to Psalm 111. 
In Genesis 20, when, when Abraham was kind of traveling around, he was with, with his wife Sarah, he, he came across, you know, these people, and, and he was worried when he went in there. I remember he lied, say, he was saying, oh, well, she's my sister, right? He wasn't letting them know that she was his wife because she thought that they were going to kill him. In Genesis 20, 11, the Bible says, and Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. So that's why he lied. He's thinking like, well, these people don't fear the Lord. They don't fear God at all. So I I'm not going to put it past them to even kill me just to get my wife because they don't care about God. And you know what? That's, that's true. Any nation that just doesn't have a fear of the Lord is going to be a really wicked people because they don't care. They, they don't see that there's any, going to be any consequences for their actions by any higher power. When they don't have a proper fear of the Lord, then they're going to end up doing whatever because who cares, right? There is no God. And that's what the atheism will, will lead to. It leads to people like Adolf Hitler. It leads to people like uh, Joseph Stalin. It leads to people that are really, really wicked people that have no problem committing atrocities against others because they have no fear of the Lord. They don't believe in a higher power that's actually going to judge them. Exodus 20, verse 20, the Bible says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. So part of fearing God has to do with keeping his commandments. Deuteronomy 5, 29 says, Oh, that there were such an heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. So when we have a proper fear of God, what are we going to do? We're going to keep his commandments. We're going to obey God because we fear him. We fear what he's going to do. This is the same way that things should be run in the household. And look, this is, this is a great way for people to understand just the fear of the Lord or the concept of the fear of the Lord. It's not some bad thing to fear God. Because some people think about this, oh, what do you mean fear? Like, it's only, like, I thought God is love. Yes, God is love. And God is merciful and long-suffering. And thank God that he, that he has those attributes. Right? He's not just some total meanie. God, God is very long-suffering and merciful, and, and we love that. But however, that's not all he is. God is a God of judgment. He's a God of justice. He's a God of revenge. The Bible says, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will repay, saith the Lord. He will recompense. He rights the wrongs. He makes sure justice is served. And he does not just wink at her. He doesn't overlook sin and wickedness. He makes sure that it's all dealt with appropriately. And God is all-powerful. Therefore, we ought to fear him. And he says, you need to fear me and keep my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. So you know what? You keep God's commandments. You have a proper fear of God. Things will go great. We'll get along just fine. And it's the same way as what I was getting to. Is, it should be the same way in the house. Because people think of this like, some people will think, oh, the fear of the Lord. It's like, like as if God's going to just, you know, one day... You're living your life, and then all of a sudden, God's just just messing with you, and you know, and kind of you know. I I don't know what some people think, but the the healthy way, the right way of understanding the fear of the Lord is the same way it would be in a household where my children know that I love them, right? They get love, they get affection, they get attention, they get teaching, they get training, but they also get discipline. My children ought to have a healthy fear of their father. Do they love their father? Yeah, they should. Of course they do. But they also need to have that fear. You can have fear and love simultaneously. And it, they both ought to be there to have a healthy relationship because without that fear, they might think in their wicked hearts, and when I say their heart is wicked, it's not because I think I have wicked children. It's just the Bible says that the heart of, you know, who knows the heart of man? It's, it, it's the heart of man is wicked in general, that, that we are born sinners and that we have a wicked heart, we have wicked flesh. So I'm not calling my children specifically like any worse than, than anyone else. But they, if they're left to their own devices, if they're left to their own desires, if they're not taught right from wrong, if they have no discipline, if they have no punishment then they will just get off into all kinds of sin. They will turn out to be horrible people. 
And they need to have that understanding and that proper fear that there is going to be recompense for what they do, that there are consequences for their actions, that, that I am the lawgiver in my household, and that I don't just say words that have no meaning or have no impact, but when I say something and they, they do the opposite and, and transgress against the law of their father, there's going to be reprisal, there's going to be a punishment, and it's going to not feel very good at all. So they need to fear that, okay, dad said not to do this, but what's going to happen if I do it anyways? If they're not getting any discipline, then, then what is going to happen? Nothing? I might raise my voice? Like, that's, that's not very much. There's nothing to be afraid of there. There's no fear. And they're not going to have a healthy fear, therefore they're not going to keep the commandments. We need to have a healthy fear. And that's the way it is with God, too. God loves us. You're born again. You're a child of God. He loves you. But because He loves you, He's also going to discipline us. He's going to discipline you when he knows, hey, you do something wrong, you'll be disciplined for it. It's not because he hates you, it's because he loves you. And we need to have that proper fear and respect for the Lord that we can't just do, you know, can't just say, oh, we're free in grace, I can just do whatever I want. No. It doesn't work like that. I mean, yeah, we're saved eternally, we're a child of God, we're not going to be unborn. But we can't just do whatever we want and expect to just get away with it and not have any type of consequence for our actions. The Bible says that we reap what we sow. And uh, we need to have that proper fear of God. Psalm 111 is where I do turn. Look at verse number 10. Psalm 111, verse number 10. This is also uh, very similar to what it says in Proverbs 1. The Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. Fear of the Lord is a good thing. That's the beginning of wisdom. That's where wisdom starts. You start off just by fearing God. You know what, God, I'm gonna, I don't even have to understand everything, but I'm just going to fear you and obey what you have to say because you said it. Because it's your words, dear God. I'm just going to do it. Now you're on the path to getting some smarts. Now you're going to get some wisdom. Bible says in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, at the very end of Ecclesiastes, it says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. The duty of man is to fear God and keep His commandments, according to the Bible, according to Ecclesiastes. That we are supposed to fear the Lord and just do what He says. It's very simple. We don't need to complicate things. Let's just do what God says and just have a fear for Him. And He'll look out for us and things will go well for us. It's like He said in the Old Testament. He says, things will go well. Things will be great. You won't have any problems. Just fear me and do what I tell you to do. Turn if you would to 1 John chapter 4. Because this is one of the reasons why people, people argue about, say, oh no, you know, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have to fear God. Or the, I, I came across someone out soul before and said, I don't make decisions based off of fear. You know, I'm giving the gospel, I'm trying to explain, you know, hey, you know, we're sinners. We deserve this punishment of hell. And I'll tell you what, it's a good way to give the gospel. To let people know that they've transgressed against God and there's a judgment against them. Because it should be a big motivator to not want to face that punishment. To not want to go to hell. It's reality. But, you know... He tries to get, like, like, as if this is some philosophical debate. Well, I don't like to make decisions based on fear. Well, yeah, I mean, the, in a sense, there's, there's a little bit of truth to that because we shouldn't just be clouded in making emotional decisions. I, but I expo the way I explained it to him was like this. I said, well, fear isn't always a bad thing. So first of all, this is a reality that God is a judge and that you, He has laws. And there is a punishment for breaking those laws and you've already broken them. So you deserve a punishment and that's just reality. Now out of His love and His mercy, He's given you a way so that you don't have to face that punishment. But it doesn't just give it out for nothing. There's actually something associated with it that you have to do. You have to put your faith in Christ. But that's the reality of the situation. But I was explaining the fear thing to him like this. said, look, do you think it's really a bad thing to, to, if you were to walk to the Grand Canyon 
And you just walk right up to it. Is, is it really a bad thing to have a little bit of a fear that you might fall over into the cliff? No, I, I think that's actually probably a good fear to have. Why? Because it's going to help keep you a little bit more safe. It's going to help keep you alive. There's certain things that, that we could be, we could have some healthy fear of that's going to do us good. And when you understand that there's an all-powerful, almighty God that controls the weather, that holds your breath in His hand, we ought to tread carefully with that God. We ought to respect that God. And yes, we ought to fear that God. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, the Bible says that, uh, you know, on some have compassion making a difference, others save with fear, pulling them out of, out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. There's a lot of people that need to be saved with that fear, that need to hear, look, there is a, there is a judgment. There's a judgment day, and we need, to, we need to be aware of that, and we need to be fearful for that. Now, once you're saved, you don't have to fear going to hell. But just because you don't have to fear going to hell, that doesn't mean you stop fearing God. Because it's not like God's only card he has to play against you is hell. Right? It's not like, oh, well, that's gone. I, I, there's nothing else I could do now. <laughs> of course not. There's a lot of things. that God could do. There's a lot of reasons still to have good fear of the Lord. Just because that's removed. Just like my children. That my children, I'll tell you what, they don't ever have to be afraid. And I'm sure they aren't. They're never afraid that I'm going to put them in my oven and just turn on bro. I'm going to lock them in there. Sorry, kid. Okay. You've just broken my, my word too many times. You broke my law. Now you're just stuck in the oven. I'm turning on broil. Forget about it. That is one fear that they never have to have. But does that mean they don't have to have any fear for their father? No, of course not. We, are, we may not have to fear going to hell, but there's a lot of reasons still to fear God. But in 1 John chapter 4, this is a, a reason that people will say, oh, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't have to fear God or we shouldn't fear God. You know, especially in the New Testament, right? Because they like to go to the New Testament. It's got so much different in the New Testament than it was in the Old Testament. Like, no, it's the same God. It was it Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? The Bible says that the Lord doesn't change, that God remains the same. So it's not like it's a different God. But in 1 John chapter 4, look at verse number 18, the Bible says there is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So the hypocrites want to take this verse and say, okay, yeah, you, you can fear God, but you know what? I don't, I don't have any fear in God because I have perfect love. Yeah, the problem with that is that if you, if you think you have perfect love for God, then you're not sinning at all. Because the Bible says also in 1 John, for this is the love of God, that you keep my commandments and my commandments are not grievous. That that is love. That is how we love God. And our love is shown to God by keeping His commandments. And when you're not keeping God's commandments, it shows you don't love God. So how can you have a perfect love and still sin and still transgress His laws? You can't. Now, when, when you can get perfect, when you can have that perfect love, then you don't have to fear. Because there will be no reason to fear when you're completely in good standing and you're not doing anything wrong. There's no reason to fear. Because God's not some sadistic God that's just going to hurt you for just no reason. He's not going to bring bad things on you and just cause you a lot of pain just for no reason whatsoever. You are absolutely perfect. Everything's great and there's just no cause and He's just going to do whatever. That's, that's not God. So there's no reason to fear. The Bible says, um, turn if you would to Romans chapter 13. Because now I want to get into kind of explaining the other verse that we read in Joshua. We saw at the end of the book of Joshua, it says that you might fear the Lord your God forever, and that we ought to fear God. And that's a very important concept to understand. But it also said in verse 14, it says, On that day the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. And I think that is also a righteous fear 
to have. When the children of Israel feared Joshua and feared Moses, and the reason why is because they're fearing the man of God that is following God and being used of God and is working with God. And that is the only reason why they should have that fear of those men is because they are acting as a man of God and actually doing what God tells them to do and, and you know, doing those things. I know they weren't perfect, but they're really doing what, what God said to do. They're not false prophets. They're not just preaching out of their own heart. They're not, you know, the, the Bible says that we're not to fear what man can do unto us, that we are to fear the Lord. And of course, the fear of the Lord gets the top. It gets the, it gets, it gets, uh, the priority. But there are instances, and Romans 13 gives us one of those instances of where it will be proper to, to fear a man. Because by and large, we shouldn't fear what man can do to us. But there are a few instances where, where it does, uh, it, it is biblical, it actually makes, and it makes sense. Romans 13 kind of gives us instruction on human government. And actually, I'm starting in verse 3, but I wanna, I'm going to turn there myself and start in verse number 1 just to get it in full context. Romans 13 is often twisted out of context anyways, and um, there's a lot of misteachings on this, but I'm not going to get into it too much tonight. Romans 13, because let me tell you, I'll, just real quickly, Romans 13 does not teach that whatever the government says or does, you just have to obey everything the government does says all the time. It does not say that. It does not teach that if you lived in Germany under Adolf Hitler, that, that you would just have to do, if he, if he tells you to exterminate people, if he tells you to, to wipe people out, whatever, whatever he says you do, that you just have to do that. That's not what the Bible teaches. It does not give human government all authority as if they're God. There are, God, there are laws that God made that trump all other laws. But there are powers that God has ordained. And God has given power to human government to rule on this earth. And, and there is specific power that God has given. Now, when a government or anybody, for that matter, goes outside of the scope of the authority that God has given to them, then it's no longer valid. It's not something that you have to obey. When the government starts telling you things like, like what you can eat and what you can wear, what you can be you on, know, just all, just, just really getting down to every single last detail of your life, you're going to, you know, that's, that's outside of their authority. God has given us rights. God has given us freedoms. God has given us ability to do things. And that's, you know, and thank God that's what this country was originally founded on was that principle that God has given us rights. That it's not government giving us rights. God gives us the rights and our human government on this earth in the United States of America actually recognized that or at least some of those in the founding documents. That's why there is a Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights wasn't written to, to give you rights from the government as if this is like your permission slip to do these things. It was actually the contrary. It was saying, you know what? The government doesn't have the right to infringe upon these rights that every person has. As a natural born human being, and by the way, it has nothing to do, and I know I'm getting a little political right now, but it has nothing to do whether or not you're a citizen of the United States. Those are actually God-given rights spelled out in the Bill of Rights. No matter where you're born, it's just that the United States of America was recognizing that as that, hey, God's given you the right to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And it spells out these various things that everybody has that right. Because God's given you that right. And when the government starts infringing on those rights that are given you by God, the government's out of line, the government's out of place, and you don't have to obey those things. Because the government can be wrong. But in Romans 13, and, and this is where, you know, and if I would have really thought about this, I would have brought my false uh, Bible versions that I had on Sunday because they really butcher Romans 13. But that'll be your homework for now. You go check out and see what they say. Because they do use the wording that's going to tell you that basically, like, whatever the government says, you just have to do. And there's a key distinction that, the, that God's word actually makes here. And it's, and it's that God has ordained powers. There are certain powers. Now, and that we ought to respect the powers that God has ordained. 
God has ordained certain powers within a church. He has a church structure. That ought to be respected. God has ordained certain powers within a family. And that ought to be respected. He's put the husband at the head of that power structure within the family. That ought to be respected. But just as much as the, that, you know, I'm a husband in my family, I have authority that's been given to me by God within my home. I don't have authority over your wife in your home to tell you and, to, and run your family as if it were mine. That's stepping outside of the, right? So like, so any wives in here today, if I tell you to, you know, go make me a meal, go, you know, whatever, that a husband might say to a wife, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. <laughs> You're not under that authority, right? It would be just fine to disobey. Now, if your husband says something like that, then you do have to obey that authority. It's because it's you're stepping. You, know, you can't step outside of the bounds of the realm that God has given you. And, and the Bible is just detailing this in Romans 13. So you know what? The government is ordained by God. There is an, a, an ordination of power that there ought to be a human government in order to prosecute, in order to punish evildoers, people who do harm unto others. That's the purpose of government. So when someone steals, when someone rapes, when someone murders, when someone does wrong and does harm to someone else, there is a, a, a judgment, there's a punishment that's set, there's, a, there's a, a process set up, there's a people set up, a government set up in order to deal with those issues. Because individuals on their own don't have extra authority to, to, to do things unto others, but God has ordained governments to possess this certain authority in order to do that. Because normally speaking, you don't just have the right to just take someone else's life. But when someone commits a crime that's worthy of death, well, there has to be some human instrument to, to, to carry out that sentence. And when it's done properly under God's authority, God's given authority, then there, it's fine. It's acceptable that the, the human that's actually carrying out the sentence is not guilty of anything because they're acting within a power that God has given unto them. So let's read what it actually says here. Verse number one, the Bible says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So what this is saying is that God has ordained certain powers, which is everything I was just trying to explain, that there are powers that God has ordained, and that we ought not to resist those powers. That the powers that God has ordained... They are of God, so we, we can't just fight against it. We can't just say, like, like, if I were just to fight against all human governmental authority, just everything, that would be fighting against the power that God has ordained. Because He has given that power. But let's keep reading in verse number 3. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Now, again, this is already defining God's authority and where God has... has given for rulers that a ruler is not a terror to good works so when you have a ruler that's making it a terror for you to do good works that's not under they're not acting under god's authority when you have a ruler that's telling you you can't preach the gospel of jesus christ you don't have to listen to that ruler in that regard at all because that is not ordained of god they are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So this is talking about the ruler. And that, hey, if you're doing good, you should have no reason to fear. Everything should just be fine. But if you are doing evil, if you are breaking the law and doing evil upon somebody, then you ought to fear the ruler because their job and their position is actually to be a minister of God and upholding God's law and executing the, judge, the justice when it needs to be served. 
And that when you are breaking those commands and those rules, then you're going to face that punishment and you ought to be fearful then because their job, that's what they're there to do. And that's what God has given them the authority to do. So we see there, all of that said, I know I got a little bit sidetracked because it's Romans 13 is kind of the way I am, but um, it's, a, it's a subject that kind of hits home to me is that there is someone to fear there. Let's keep reading here, though. Verse number four, the Bible says, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Excuse me, verse number five. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. So again, in verse number six, I'm not against all forms of taxation because the Bible says right here that there's a reason why you pay tribute. And, and the tribute is made to basically pay for the people who are in those offices to execute the judgment that, that God has given them authority to do. Right, that, that there is tribute due there because they have a job to do and that there's a function for their job. Now, our taxes today and taxes worldwide go to fund all kinds of other things that are completely outside of the scope and the authority that God has given them. Okay, so I'm not for any of that. And actually, if we, if we only funded people who are actually doing and carrying out what, what God has ordained for government to do, it would be very, very, it would almost be like you had no taxes. It, that's, that's what it would be. It would be so small, you'd feel like, I'm happy to pay whatever because it's, because it's almost nothing because there's so, you know, with so many people, there's, you, know, you don't need all these. I mean, how many judges are there? I don't know. I mean, I'm just like, like hundreds, or maybe some, you know, like, like in a given locale, a given area. Like you don't need lots and lots and lots. Of, you, know, you have judges to judge these matters, and that's essentially what these rulers are supposed to be. They're supposed to be judges. And they're supposed to be the ones that are hearing the evidence and, you know, trying to people and, and making sure that justice is served. That's the authority. And again, I'm not going to get in all the details of, of every little thing, but. Um, so that's and that's why also it's not, you know, the, you ought to pay tribute. You say that for this cause, pay you tribute also. For they are God's ministers attain continually upon this very thing. Verse number seven. Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due. You know, it doesn't say tribute to whom tribute is not due. It says tribute to whom tribute is due. Custom to whom custom. Fear to whom fear. And honor to whom honor. So there are certain people that we ought to have fear of. But in their proper place. It's not just anyone. It's not just... And I'll tell you what, we shouldn't fear a wicked ruler. We shouldn't have a fear of them. Someone who's, who's acting against God, we ought not to fear that person. What we're told to fear is, is someone who's acting as a minister of God who's actually doing righteous judgment. Because if we're doing wrong, then we definitely need to fear because it's, it's due. We, ought, we deserve a punishment. And when we sin against God, right, that would be a righteous punishment for us to receive from God. We fear God for that reason. But just as King Herod was a wicked ruler, John the Baptist wasn't afraid of him. He still preached the word of God, even though it cost him his head. And we ought not to fear a ruler that's just someone against God, like an enemy of the gospel or an enemy of God. That is not who we fear. We only need to fear when ultimately we're the source of, of doing things wrong. When we transgress, when we transgress, you know, laws that are ordained by God or against God's laws, you know, these are the things that we need to fear and uh, the people then that would end up recompensing uh, those, those transgressions. So um, a couple more verses here. Turn if you would. So if you go to Genesis 31. Let's see, I'm doing on time. Okay, well, I'm going to wrap this up. We're almost done. Ephesians 6, 5 says, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling. Remember, I saw how fear isn't just respect. Because it says there that servants are to be obedient to their masters. 
Right? And this isn't just this is not about slaves, it's about servants. There's, uh, there's people who serve, and there are people who are over the servants, who are bosses, right? And it says that the servants are to be obedient to them that your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. Why? Because they have that authority. There's the people that have the authority over you, watching to make sure you're doing things right or whatever. It says, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Again, that's another appropriate fear. And what, now what we're going to see, the last thing I'm going to point out are some examples here of not just fear of God, but also of the man of God, someone who's actually just carrying out what God wants them to do. In Romans 13, it's, it's the ruler. If they're doing what God has for them to do, then there's a healthy fear of the ruler. When uh, In Genesis 31, we're going to see here with, with Jacob, he's talking to Laban. And he brings up the fear of his father, Isaac. That Laban had a fear of Isaac. Look at verse number 41 in Genesis 31. The Bible reads, Thus have I been twenty years in thy house. I served thee fourteen years for thy two daughters, and six years for thy cattle, and thou hast changed my wages ten times. Except the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had been with me, surely thou hadst sent me away now empty. God hath seen mine affliction and the labor of my hands, and rebuked thee yesternight. When people are followers of the Lord and are doing God's will, there ought to be a healthy fear of that person as well. And the reason why is just because they're carrying out God's commands. And the power of God is upon them to carry out God's commands. So the power of God was upon Moses. So as long as Moses is following the Lord and following God, the people needed to have a healthy fear of him. Joshua, as long as he's following the Lord and he's carrying on that torch and he's doing what God has for him to do, and he's the leader that God has ordained and put in charge, hey, there ought to be a fear of him also. Isaac was a godly man and was living a godly, righteous life, and, and God's blessing was upon him, and God's power was with him. Therefore, Laban had a fear of Isaac. Now, Jacob had a lot of things that he did wrong. And he was reaping what he sowed. When he stole the blessings from Esau, when he, when he, when he did, you know, when he acted in a way he shouldn't have acted, now, you know what? It's coming back home to roost. But, but ultimately, though, Jacob ended up doing what was right and was living a righteous life. And then the power of God was with him also. Right? Not as much early on, but, hey, the, the, the fear of Isaac was put into Laban. And he knew and he could see all the blessings even that Jacob was having. And, and Laban ended up not doing things. Like, like he probably would have taken action against Jacob when he decided to leave with his wives and his children and everything. Just like, I'm out of here. But he didn't. Because he knew that God was with him. And that's why he ended up having that fear and the fear of Isaac. Because he actually, it, it was, it was a, like a proxy fear of the Lord. And that's where the healthy fear comes from of, of man, whether it be, you know, Moses or Joshua. It's they're fearing Joshua or Moses because they fear the Lord, because ultimately they fear God. So if this man is acting for God, because I fear the Lord, I'm going to fear them also. I'm going to fear the power that, that God has given unto them. Look, jump down to verse number 51 there in Genesis 31. The Bible says, And Laban said to Jacob, Behold this heap, and behold this pillar which I have cast betwixt me and thee. This heap be witness, and this pillar be witness, that I will not pass over this heap to thee, and that thou shalt not pass over this heap and this pillar unto me for harm. The God of Abraham, and the God of Nahor, and the God of, of their father judge betwixt us. And Jacob swear, swear by the fear of his father Isaac. We see other examples. I'm not going to have you turn there, but in Esther, uh, this talks about the fear of Mordecai fell upon the people. So remember all the way near the end of Esther when um, the king Ahasuerus let Mordecai and then make some of the rules and, and he, he proclaimed that the children of Israel would be able to defend themselves and anyone that came against them, they would, you know, that they would be able to uh, defeat them and, uh, and fight against them and fight for their lives. And then the, the fear of the Jews and the fear of Mordecai fell on the people. Why? Because Mordecai ended up being exalted into such a, a position of power, and God was with him. 
and, and the, the works of God were seen in that whole story of, with, uh, you know, with God's people in, in Esther. And then also in King David, we're close on this. Turn, if you would, to 2 Samuel 23, because this is just going to tie it all in. In 1 Chronicles 14, we see that, that the fear of David came upon other nations, and that there was a fear of him. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 16, the Bible says, David therefore did as God commanded him. And they smote the host of the Philistines from Gibeon even to Gezer. And the fame of David went out into all lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. And notice that God's bringing the fear also. God brought the fear of Moses. God exalted Joshua for the purpose of the people fearing him and respecting him and following his leadership because God wanted him in that position. God is the one that's, that's bringing this about. He's the one who gave the fear of David and, and the nations round about. Why? Because David is following him. He's going to God and he's, and he's doing what God is telling him to do. And then in 2 Samuel 23, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, and the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. So when you have a man of God, that's a ruler as Moses, as Joshua, or even as some official, if they're, if they're ruling according to, you know, justly, if they're ruling over men and they're just and they're ruling in the fear of God, then that is where in turn, you know, a, a, a healthy fear of that person would, would, would come from. Now, In our, in, our, in our current culture and society, it's hard to find someone who would be worthy of even have, possessing that type of fear. Because these people that we have the examples of in Scripture are literally people who are like men of God, people who are following God, and that command that type of respect just because they have the power of God on them. So I just I don't want to I don't want to be unclear in any way in the teaching on this on this subject, but I do want to point it out because while the vast majority of the time God's saying fear not, fear not, I'm with you, don't worry about anything. You have to fear what man can do unto you. You know, fear him that's able to cast both soul and body into hell. You know, don't fear what man can do unto you. There are a few times where we need to have fear, and ultimately though it all boils back to just having a fear of God. If someone's acting in the will of God, it's the, the fear comes from the fear of the Lord. The people who feared Joshua in Joshua uh, chapter 4 were only fearing Joshua because they had a fear of the Lord. Well, let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, your, for the teaching from your word. God, I pray that you please help us all to learn more doctrine and that you would um, help us understand your words better. God, I pray that you please strengthen our church, build this church, Lord, and help us all to take away the things that we learn and apply them appropriately in our lives today in 2018 and that we would be able to live our lives principled and with integrity according to your laws, your judgments, your testimonies and the things just that are, that are true and right from your word. God, help us understand those things and also be bold enough to and, and have the courage to actually apply them in our life. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.